Everybody will be able All right, can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Let me get rid of that. All right, as Jillian said, my name's Ron Rhodes. I live in South Pomfret, Vermont, so not far from the park, about, I don't know, five miles, maybe six miles. Um, I am serving right now as the interim director of our organization, um, and hopefully we're going to hire someone here this summer so I can go back to my real job, which is uh, overseeing our restoration program. So we do uh, dam removals, old dams, um, culverts. We work with farmers who have erosion problems, which you'll see a lot. And we'll talk about that today. And uh, private owners, landowners. Um, sometimes we're focused on species like brook trout or wood turtle and trying to create you know, habitat for those species. And other times we're trying to fix water quality problems, um, nitrogen, excess nitrogen or E. coli in the river or the tributaries. So there's the watershed. So all of those tributaries, right? The Ottaquichi River that flows through Woodstock and all of the small streams like Pomfret Brook that flows into the Ottaquichi River, all of those, those streams and that landscape are all part of our watershed. So it's four states, it's actually a little bit of it in Maine and of course the headwaters um, are across the border into Canada. But most of our work is in New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. The organization was created in 1952 by a group of citizens. Um, it was, a, you know, back then, most of our rivers were polluted. I know the Ottaquichi River, I've heard stories from folks that say, you know, it ran yellow and pink and purple and whatever color the, the mills were whatever clothes they were making that day and dying. Um, same thing with the Connecticut River. It was chock full of sewage. We actually have a picture of our uh, first president of the board in his boat with like, a, he's got it like a gas mask on and he's got a rubber glove and holding up a handful of sewage. Um, so we've come a long way since then, obviously, thanks to the Clean Water Act and, and lots of work by organizations like Connecticut River Conservancy. The river itself, the main stem is 410 miles long and the halfway point is roughly Sumner's Falls, if you've ever been there um, over in Heartland, Vermont. And so um, most of the river is in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, I forget the exact breakdown was something like 215 miles um, or so are in Vermont, New Hampshire. Although most of the people, most of the 3 million people obviously live in the lower half of the river. Hartford, Springfield uh, being the two biggest cities on the river. One of the interesting facts that I like to think about is this, you know, we provide, this river provides, this watershed provides 70% of the fresh water to Long Island Sound. Now that's important when we're talking about water quality and nitrogen because you know we have an excess nitrogen issue in the Connecticut River and when that nitrogen goes down and collects in the Long Island Sound they've had problems in the past with you know algae blooms and fish kills and again that that type of thing has gotten better but it's still something that the US EPA is working with the states on in Connecticut and Massachusetts being the main focus but Vermont and New Hampshire are also engaged in that process to clean up the river and the water quality and reduce nitrogen. So erosion, one of the main reasons why we plant riparian buffers that we're talking about today is something that looks like this, right? A corn or a hay field that has gone right up to the, sorry about that, right up to the banks. So there are no root systems to, um, to hold that sandy soil, glacial soil, right, in place. Um, you know, you will see various projects to try to mitigate this. We, you can use riprap and rocks. You often see that along the highways. 
where the VTrans or New Hampshire DOT has, has put in riprap to help protect a road. A lot of that work was done after Irene to shore up uh, river banks where there was a house or a bridge or some you know infrastructure at risk. But when we're working with farmers or towns, like we see a lot of rec fields that are built right along the river and have this type of erosion problem, and also with private landowners, there's some softer, gentler ways to do uh, some of these fixes that we'll talk about. Uh, riprap is, while it does solve the erosion problem at your site, it tends to create a problem upstream or downstream or even across the river for your neighbors because thinking that high flow like Irene flows, right? That water comes ripping down through there and hits that rock and it bounces off. It doesn't, you know, absorb the energy of that flow. And so the flow bounces off and usually creates a similar problem. You know, it takes years, but it creates a similar problem somewhere else in the near neighborhood, so to speak. So this is often what we're dealing with. We work with the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, and they have an NRCS office in White River. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service is often a partner on some of these. And of course, the state of Vermont has um, funding available. So our job as a nonprofit organization is to help the landowner fix these issues. And you know, the way I say it is we are basically staffing the project for the landowner if they want us to. You know, we will go write the grants and find the money, hire the contractors, you know, get the volunteers out there to plant the trees so that the landowner doesn't have the cost or the time commitment. Because, you know, think about a dairy farmer, right? How much time and money do they have to put into a problem like this? So a lot of nonprofits um, can help make that happen so that back to the um 70 percent of the fresh water to long island sound and and the erosion issues we were just looking at in that last picture this is a satellite photo of the long island sound the day after tropical storm irene so that is vermont and new hampshire down in dumping into the long island sound so you know, obviously that was an extreme event, but um, I think it's fair to say that we're getting more of more extreme extreme events, and you know that was a hundred year flood that happens less more frequently than every hundred years, right? And the last flood we had around here in Ottaquichi in Woodstock was seventy four, I think it was seventy three, seventy four, and then another one in two thousand eleven. So we're we're going to be facing this type of uh, increased precipitation in the future. And um, if we fix some of these problem sites and reduce the erosion, we're never going to eliminate it. You know, that's what rivers do, right? They move rock and sand and gravel. They're sort of a conveyor belt. And what we're trying to do is get, get the stream back to its natural state and put some trees in, maybe some other protections to help hold those banks in place and have a natural rate of erosion, as opposed to the, the ones, the banks that have been clear cut or have grass or whatever right up to the edge. So here's the good news. I was talking a little bit about the partners and the funding. So if you are a town official with some erosion problems or you're a private landowner on a stream, you are not alone. There is help out there. Um, as I said, watershed groups like Connecticut Conservancy um, do these projects and there are funding, there are agencies, um, and there are private foundations that help fund this work. So we spend most of the winter writing grants and getting uh, agreements in place to do these projects. And then We've already started our spring tree planting. Um, we were up in West, uh, well, Post Mills, Vermont, planting uh, last week. And then we've got plantings basically throughout the month of May. So we do spring and fall planting. So mid-April to late May. And then again in October, basically. 
So we get all those funds in place, the agreements in place, and then we put the uh, planting crews to work in the spring and the fall. So this is just a, a brief you know, overview if anyone wants additional information about any of these funders or partners. Um, let me know either in the chat or afterwards you can send me an email and happy to share more details with you. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the how we work with uh, landowners and we have a conservation scientist on staff and he is in charge of our riparian restoration program. We do a lot of floodplain forest restoration where um, you know I think our biggest site has been 11 acres, uh, a former ag field that we um, returned to a silver maple floodplain forest. So 11 acres, I forget how many trees we planted there, um, a lot <laughs> over several weeks of you know digging holes and putting trees in the ground. So he, he does this technical assistance, right? We come out, we look at the site, we, um, have some usually some professional opinions about what might work we often will ask the state or one of those federal partners to come to the site or at least look at the the map and the pictures to confirm that you know our thinking is and they agree with that and then we'll do um, some basic you know mapping like this that would show where we would do those buffer plantings it's a little hard to tell on this one. This is down in Weathersfield, just down 106. Um, obviously the big problem here was this big bend where there's erosion around here, but there was also a brook, a small tributary that came down in here. And this was a, a hay field that's still actively hayed. And so really what we're often working with as a farmer who, you know, hates to lose some land, um, and it's kind of a question for them of, okay, I'm going to lose two feet or five feet every year, every time we get a high flow, usually in the spring, but obviously sometimes in the summer, like Irene, um, ice out, you know, and all that high flow starts taking away more and more soil out of that bank. And he's losing more and more acreage. Now, if we come in and do a tree planting, you know, we need some buffer width, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And you're going to lose, you know, some of that um, 35 feet or 50 feet, you know, in a planting. And but you can see how the in this map where the trees are on the neighboring and that piece in between, right? There is a buffer there, and it, they have held up. And the the roots of the shrubs and the trees really do help keep that soil in place for a much longer time. And you know. Some obviously some trees do fall in the river and that's fine. Wood is good as far as habitat goes. Um, and like I said before, we're never going to stop erosion totally, but slow it down to a manageable speed, I guess. In addition, the Fritz, our conservation scientist, would do a write up. So you get that map and then this type of write up where he goes out and does the site. Um, so this was a 11 acre property. We worked with the town of Orford, the conservation commission owned a piece of property and um, leased it out to a local farmer for a hay field. And so we came in and did uh, several different uh, pieces of work, including the invasive plants, removed those prior to the planting. So it was a couple years, I think we took on this one. And then we planted the buffer both along the Connecticut River and Jacobs Brook, which flows us down through Norford into Connecticut to help mitigate that erosion that they were concerned about. So Fritz would do a write up like this and present that to the landowner. And then, you know, we make a decision about moving forward together. Oh, well, there's another map. So that's the Billings Farm. So several years ago, we got a grant from the state um, after Irene. Um, you can kind of see where the water went in Irene, all that sandy stuff from site nine down through site three. You know, this was all where the river, instead of taking this bend, the river just cut right through during Irene and left all that 
sand and sediment on the fields and they lost the buffers that were there. Um, they actually had some decent buffers like at site nine and site seven. And so we got a grant from the state and we went in and replanted those. We also did some plantings over on Barnard Brook uh, by the foundation offices on the other side of the farm. And so far, those um, have done very well. Um, if we see any dead, uh, too much dead loss, we always assume like we want 70% survival rate, right? We're gonna plant three or four or five foot tall tree you know, deer are going to browse on them. The voles might get at them in the winter. Um, but as long as we're getting 70% survival, um, then we feel good about that. We're planting at usually 400 stems per acre. So one of the things Fritz does is measured out the acreage. And then with that determines how many um, shrubs and trees we're going to plant at that site. And if we get, you know, I think twice we've had less than 70% survival. Um and just just did a spring planting and then that didn't rain for the next two weeks and it's hard to go out and water a thousand plants um so you know once we get them in the ground they're sort of on their own and we do monitor them we go back to the site and monitor them and if we don't get that 70 percent, then we often will come back and do another replanting we'll go back to the funder and say you know we need we want to put in another you know 200 or 300 stems whatever it is so that we make sure that buffer is ultimately what we had hoped it would be and you know that trees are going to take some time to grow up but they do start having benefits right away so this is an example um, of one of fritz's tree orders um, again we do all this work from the landowner um, Intervale Conservation Nursery up in Burlington, Vermont. They have bare root stock that we um, get from them. And we also use New England wetland plants down in Amherst, Mass. We usually use them in the fall or depending on the site, a really rocky site um, that doesn't have good soil because they do potted plants. And so you have that root system already established and you have some soil that comes with the plant so fritz decides you know which which way we're going to go with that um and you can see the species here it really depends on the um site you know we're trying to match the same species that are on the site so for example that silver maple floodplain forest you know the reason that was done was because that's what it used to be and that's what was growing there around the the former farm field so lots of shrubs, uh, the willows, the dogwoods um, are awesome. You know, the, the beaver can chew on them and they just send out new shoots. Um, the ice can take them out. They send out new shoots. So we put those right up along the, the worst erosion spots and right up along the river's edge. And then we put the um, trees and some of the other shrubs a little further back. Um, some landowners want, you know, more sugar maples and, you know, maybe they want some uh, high, high bush uh, cranberries and blueberries and all of that's fine. We can work all of that into the, the planting plan and the species order. We've done plantings for um, various, you know, wildlife if, if someone's focused on a particular species or even for uh, butterflies, right? We can add the pollinator species into the planting list as long as the nurseries have them available then it's something we can uh, work with the landowner on and and make a, a planting plan that is is diverse but also uh, what the landowner is interested in so i mentioned invasive plants that is a big one um, this is that map from the orford site and you know it it doesn't make a lot of sense to go in and plant three foot tall trees and shrubs if you have 10 foot tall Japanese knotweed or honeysuckle shading out those plants. So we are often going in and removing invasives first. We've got a couple of pictures of Fritz and I uh, standing in a field with, you know, a pile of invasives taller than, than we are. Um, sometimes we'll hire a crew, you know, if it's like at the Billings Farm, their knotweed problem was pretty extensive and they hired Red Start Forestry out of 
um, Corinth, who is a license applicator, and they come down and, and sprayed the knotweed because it's, you know, damn near impossible to get rid of uh, manually. And, and if you do, it takes, you know, years and years, like seven years, you know, of multiple cuttings and, you know, managing. So some of the landowners um, opt for a, a chemical treatment of the knotweed. Um, we don't do that. We're not licensed to do that, but, you know, we do contract with folks if that's what uh, landowners are interested in. So invasive species is just another uh, aspect of the planting. Om almost always, there are rare cases where we are doing a planting and don't have invasive species to deal with. And once the, you know, the good thing is once the trees grow up and the buffer grows up, that does help shade out some of those invasives. I won't, I won't say it, you know, prevents them from growing at all, but they have pretty good success. And there's an example of that Orford site. Um, you know, we use the farmer's tractor um, to help pull out the honeysuckle. Some of it was uh, too big to, to tackle. And sometimes we will just leave it, you know, depending on the bank, if it's sort of an eroding bank, then we might leave it and cut it off so that we're not disturbing those roots. Um, so it really just is site specific as to how we manage the invasives. There's purple loose drive. Amazing thing about that is they've got, I think it's 2 million seeds in each of those, you know, um, sprigs coming off of the plant. So it spreads like wildfire. Um, and that's one that's e easily managed um, manually. You know, as you can see here in the bottom picture, the eighth graders from uh, Piermont School were helping us um, get rid of the purple loose strife. So it's it's not uh, something that requires uh, usually a contractor or any equipment. Uh, mentioned the work crews. So we do the plantings. If it's, you know, a small planting, 150 stems, 200 stems, then our staff and our members and donors or Trout Unlimited volunteers will come out and do the planting. But again, some of these sites we're planting, you know, over a thousand stems or 3000 stems, and it takes all week and we hire a professional crew. This is the crew from Northwood Stewardship Center. They're one of our regular planters. Um, we work with Red Star out of Corinth also. That's who did the planting for us in Post Mills last week. And we just include that in our grant writing. You know, so we have money to buy the trees and then we have money to pay the crews on the big planting. Uh, picture of interval nursery with delivering. So they deliver all the stock. Both, um, both of our nurseries will deliver the plants to the site for us. Um, which helps with the survivability, um, you know, not out of the water for too awful long. And we water them when they get there and then plant them as quickly as possible. Uh, bottom picture, that's that school group in Piermont. So, you know, again, a somewhat small planting that we did with the eighth graders. Um, and we often use volunteers in addition to the crew. So like this spring, if you go to our website, um, you'll see volunteer opportunities. And one of the things is tree plantings. And so even if we have a paid crew, we always offer folks the opportunity to come out and get their hands dirty and their feet wet and enjoy a spring day of tree planting if they'd like to. So it's a nice way to get folks out on the river. And just some more pictures of past projects. Um, these were both up on the Wells River and two different farms that, um, as you can see, especially in the top one there, outside bend, you know, you, those outside bends where the current is the fastest and doing the most, um, erosive force and taking that hay field, uh, away every, every spring, basically. Um, so we can see the red osier dogwoods and, some of the willow stakes sticking out of the ground. I'll talk about those in a little bit, but, and then again, I mentioned the shrubs up close and then the trees a little bit further back. There's uh, another picture of the tree delivery. So those are the potted plants from New England wetland plants I was speaking about. Um, those were in tall ones. Um, so one 
one issue with the potted plants is they cost more. Um, bare root is usually like five or six dollars per per plant. And these potted plants are, you know, 10 to $12. So it's twice the cost. Um, and again, you know, if we know that going in, then we can grant rate for that and um, hopefully get the funds to make that happen for those situations where it's needed. Again, we do that mostly in the fall and at some of our dam removal sites where it's really rocky and you don't have good soil. But, you know, a lot of times if we're planting in the spring in a hay field, it's perfectly good soil. So um katie kane in the top left there she's from u.s fish and wildlife service um katie's a great partner u.s fish and wildlife service provides funding for these projects they often will will provide like a 10 percent match and then she also um helps with species selection um she also helps us figure out you know the right if it's the right fit if the project is good, um, she's one of those people we would call early on in the process and figure out if this is something that they're interested in in partnering with us on to make make sure it happens. Um, and that's an old picture in the bottom right from the Black River from years ago. Uh, that actually, you know, we don't often plant evergreens, pines. You, we do see them along the rivers, but they're really more of an upland species. Um, so again, it you know it's that's part of Fritz's job of doing those species selection, what um, makes the sense, what's naturally growing there, and then also, you know, as I said before, working with the landowner. But occasionally we do find um, situations where we're planting white pine or or other evergreens, not our typical. Live stakes and fascines. So I don't know if everybody knows about these. Um, so those willows and those red or dogwoods, like we have them growing around our pond. And usually every late late fall or early spring, um, after they are dormant, we go and cut them down. Um, and you can take the tops, which is shown here, the fascines, they call them, and you bundle them up, you dig a trench in the soil and will root and grow and we've used them in a number of different ways usually um, perpendicular to the stream and so you think about the river rising up and coming through that that floodplain or that bench along right along the river if you put these fascines in there now you've got like a wall of willows and you do multiple sets of those and so it really is a, a awesome way to get fairly cheap quick growing um, vegetation along the banks that will help slow down those floodwaters. And I said earlier that beavers will chew on them, the ice will take them out, and they just send keep sending out new shoots. They're they're awesome. They're resilient. Um, one of the one of the best ways and easiest ways to get some uh, natural growth on our river banks. And there's the live stakes. So that's a crew of uh, volunteers. Um, White River Partnership and Trout Unlimited members um, went out to uh, a farmer's land on the White River and cut some of those willow stakes. So those tops, you know, these are the tops and those are the bottoms. And you pound, we pound those stakes in to the the worst spots on the on the site, the really eroded areas, the the steep slopes um, where you don't necessarily want to people to be walking or it's not safe or you don't want to plant a tree there because you know the possibility of it getting swept away in a high, in a high flow and these stakes are if you're taking them you know here and you're cutting them it doesn't cost you anything except for volunteer time but we do buy them also the nurseries offer them and they're just a great way to to really pound a bunch of stakes into a, an area that is completely exposed, doesn't have any, you know, grass or oftentimes we're, we're planting them in really rocky, you know, situations where a, a, a root, a stem with a root on it wouldn't survive. So another wonderful aspect there. There's a couple of pictures of people on a, a very steep slope pounding in stakes. And that bottom right one is a dam removal site we did. So you can see, you know, we pound them in, leave a little bit out the top 
and they will root and grow. Chillin, do we have a chat question? What time of year do you harvest the willows? Yeah, so spring and fall, so they have to be dormant, Marty. Um, if you you can't go out and do it now because they've all started to bud out, right? So it'd be early spring, February, you know, maybe really early in April, and then in late fall. And so after they have gone dormant again in the fall. If you do it when they're live, um, we have uh, on occasion done it where we're doing a construction project and we got a big yellow machine and a contractor out on the stream banks and we're watering. And if that, you know, in that case, we have had decent success, but you have to water them constantly in that case. So normally it's done in late spring, early fall. And you can keep them, you know, we, we've had a, a farmer who let us put them in his cooler. And so we actually harvest them early, keep them in the cooler so they stay dormant, and then bring them out for the planting in May. Um, so if you have a situation like that, then you could, you know, put them in later. But that's probably a rare situation. All right, so I just gave you a few pictures of before and after. This was over in, I think that's Piermont or Orford. So it's 91 in the background and the, the Palisades rocks uh, formations over on the Vermont side. So that's what the old cornfield um, that was taken out of production and right along the river. And, you know, there were no, basically no plants, as you can see, other than the grass. And then a few years after our planting, and that's Fritz there in the green, carrying a couple of bare root stock, and then our one of our crew members. So a few years after the planting, it looked like that. So big, big difference in terms of number of root systems in that bank. And that has held up now, I forget how many years ago that was fair amount maybe anywhere I don't know five to ten years ago so it's probably grown up even more than that now and you know once we plant those trees in there and, and you stop mowing I mean other things are growing up in there naturally right so it's a lot of that is just natural regrowth um, we're putting the maples and the birch and the you know dogwoods in there to help jump start it but then really with no mowing going on or other types of management in there, Mother Nature takes over and and makes it happen. So that was a 50 foot wide buffer. We talked about buffer widths a little bit. This one was 35 foot. So this was asked after Irene, um, top left, that is the Bradford Golf Course on the Waits River. And they had some major uh, bank erosion, as you can see there, caused by Irene. And we got uh, Grant, and we actually did a little bank stabilization there. So we got um, root wads. So basically you harvest trees, big trees, often pines or softwoods with a big root ball on the end. And you dig a trench or you punch them into the bank so that in high flow, the water is hitting the root wads and the wood and not the exposed soil. Um, so that's one of those softer measures as opposed to riprap that we often do. And then we planted the 35 foot buffer on top of the bank after that work was done. And just to the left of the, the big trees that are there, that's the golf course. So that, I forget what hole it is, but there's a green, you know, right there. So stabilize the bank for them. Um, you know, if you hit your ball that far out of, off the course into the buffer, you might lose it, but it's better than losing the hole. So they were they were happy with the results. Um, this is another small stream again, again old hay field. Um, it flooded every year, so the farmer just got finally tired. It wasn't worth it; wasn't big enough, you know, to have to go in and clean it up every year to, in order to hay it again. And so I believe they donated it to the town, and it became part of the town forest in the background there and the town asked us if we could help you know mitigate some of the erosion problems and so that's a good before and after picture and this is one of those places where we use those fishines and we did sort of you know a wall of vegetation along this these outside bends 
um, again, probably 10 years ago and it's held up, you know, even at Billings farm, there were some plantings done, um, before Irene and a lot of those held up through Irene, maybe, you know, not the, not all of them, of course, but, um, it is a very effective way to stop the erosion or reduce the erosion and mitigate the, the effects of, you know, those high flood waters it really does slow them down. So buffer widths, um, in Vermont, there are no buffer width requirements for rivers and streams. So, you know, there are landowners who will go out and cut down their trees along the brook. Um, and that is, that is currently legal um, unless there are an ag uh, producer, then there are some uh, fairly new rules in Vermont about agricultural buffers. It doesn't have to be a tree buffer. It can be um, grass or other um, zone, if you will, between the river and their fields. Um, that's still pretty new. Um, not sure, uh, a couple of years, maybe, well, maybe it's been five years now, but in Vermont, lakes have a hundred foot setback. Um, so do wetlands, the class one wetlands and the smaller, uh, wetlands, class two wetlands are 50 foot. So we do have some buffer requirements in Vermont. Uh, New Hampshire has, uh, slightly different rules. Their buffers requirements are around what they call designated rivers. So the Connecticut River is a designated river. And um, if there is a buffer there currently, you can't go in and cut that down. Um, there's different you know, rules about the length, the buffer widths. Um, but a lot of cases, you know, there's no buffer. The buffers were cut, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and so we're reestablishing buffers in many cases. Um, but the, the idea is that 35 feet is sort of the minimum buffer width in order, you know, one row of trees isn't going to do it for you, right? It's not going to hold that soil in place. It's not going to create that fish and wildlife habitat. It's not going to create the shade that benefits the brook. So really we're looking for 15, uh, 35 feet occasionally we get in a situation where maybe there's a building or something um, and we can't do 35 feet. So there's a little bit of wiggle room, but usually the funders, the state, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, NRCS, the U.S. Department of Ag, they all have that 35 minimum requirement for the most case. If you're, if you're looking for help and funding, 50 and 100, even better. So it really depends on the site and what land that is available all right i think i almost hit our time mark here um there is my contact info our website you can find us there um again i'm right here close to the parks and there's my email um we are happy to help anybody whether you live in the connecticut river or not if you're somewhere else we'll connect you with the right people um the more trees we get planted in you know throughout the state and our watershed and others the better so with that i'll stop sharing and we can open it up to questions how steep is too steep janet ask it's a good question janet um there's no, you know, when we're doing a project, we're usually, if we're peeling a bank back, right, if it's straight up and down and we're peeling that bank back with excavators, we usually do a two to one or three to one slope. Um, but if that's not part of the solution, right, excavators, because now you're talking about a, a much bigger project and more money. And in some cases, you know, there are big banks along the Connecticut River that we don't do that with, and we just put the buffer in. Um, so it's really more of a safety issue than it is a planting issue. Um, you saw those that picture of those people. Yeah, that was a pretty steep bank, and those folks were out on it 
pounding stakes in. So as long as it's safe and you or others can get onto that slope and get back out without having to fall down in the river, um, then those willows will grow. They, they are amazing. Those willows and dogwoods are amazing. They will grow oh. damn near anywhere you put them. <laughs> okay. So, uh, th hi, this is Janet. Um, so they can, because they'd have to almost like hook okay. up, you know, at a, at a you know, that angle to grow up. And yep. I am, um, you know, I'm, I'm just wrestling with, um, with how I think part of the problem is, is that there's not enough of a buffer around the cattails um, to kind of help hold the excess water. And so, um, and you know, it's just a little bit of a tricky site. And I think in the larger scheme of things, it's probably fairly small potatoes um, in terms of the, the, the creek and then the wetlands, but I just keep watching it get worse. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out, it's like, well, it still is soil that's <laughs> flowing you know, flushing off of the site and it's, um, it's, it goes down into it. It's a valley area. So it's perfectly safe for me to stick those things into the bank, keep the cattails there, and then maybe just try to plant a wider buffer zone of trees and shrubs behind, I'm thinking behind the cattails. Yeah. Or send me, email me some pictures and we'll okay. take a look at it. Or, you know, if, if you want, um, we can come out and even do a site visit and okay. give you some thoughts that way. Okay, great. I will do that. Do we have any other questions? Ron, I have a question, um, and I don't know how relevant it is, but um, I work with the Ataquichi River Trail group mm -hmm. over there in... in uh, Woodstock and I was just out the other day and we've got um, beavers now taking down a lot of trees right there, you know, along, along the edge of the river. Yep. How concerned should we be? I mean, obviously it's not a habitat that's going to be um, in the long term, a place that they're going to be able to hang out, but they are, they are doing some serious damage at this point. Yep. So beavers are a, a constant uh, uh, concern when it comes to the buffer plantings. There are several things you can do. Number one, you know, when we plant in an area we know has beaver activity, we choose the species. Um, they don't like certain species. Um, you know, anything with uh, sap in the in the bark under the bark. Um, so species selection can help. Um, and the willows, the dogwoods, the, um, you know, there are certain species that if they do eat and, but they just grow right back. Box elder is another one. I know some people don't like a box elder because there's not one stem. It kind of looks, you know, scraggly or messy to some people, but that's another one. You know, I know a farmer who goes down and cuts his box elders down and they just, send out new shoots right he does it so they don't get too big and fall over into the river um so same thing with the beaver box elder would be a great species to plant because they can chew on them and the trees just keep growing the other thing that some folks have done we haven't done done this but you know you can put chicken wire up um and also there's some folks that are doing you add some sand to paint and you paint the I don't know, three bottom three feet of the trunk and the sand, uh, they don't like the beavers don't like the sand. They won't chew on the sand. So there are a couple of different ways, Wendy, to to tackle the beaver problem. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate and that. I would say that they all help, but whether or not they, you know, solve it completely. <laughs> I'm just hoping they go away because, you know, the Atacuichi is <laughs> running pretty hard and fast there. It just doesn't seem to be a place that they would want to stay anyway, but they, they are persisting. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of bank beavers um, in the, you know, they're on the White River and that's an even bigger watershed with more flow. Um, and yet, you know, there's lots of bank beavers. Um, and so there are, those. I guess those are my uh initial thoughts on it but if you uh again if always happy to come out and walk the site and talk with folks
Great. Thank you. I mean, you are pretty much in the backyard, so. Yes. Yeah. Not far. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Nick, did you have a question? Um, I was just intrigued, you know, not weeds a perennial problem. I have only have a small piece of land. It's a problem for me. I've tried Roundup. I've tried physically cutting it back. It just, even with things like Roundup, it keeps on coming back every year. I don't know if there are any smart solutions. It is the biggest challenge, even probably bigger challenge than the beavers. Um, again, Red Start um, and I'm sure there are other companies um, that are licensed to spray um, that has in some cases worked well. Now it takes multiple times, right? You can't just do it once you hit it in the fall, you hit it again in the spring, you probably hit it again in the fall. Um, and some people have done it manually. They put black plastic down, they put bark mulch or chips on top of it, you know, um, We've done manual cuttings where we go in and get it two or three times a year. And, but, you know, it can literally take five to seven years to knock the stuff back. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is a constant challenge um, if you have it. And especially, you know, the kit, not everybody wants to use the chemicals. And so, um, but I guess that'd be my, my, suggestion is you know maybe look at one of those companies that is licensed to spray it because they do it um with a applicator so they wait till the plants are leafed out and then they go and they spray underneath the leaves and the leaves then absorb the chemical into the roots i know a woman down on the black river who used to cut them and then she would take a syringe and put the roundup yeah down into the stem right so it was getting down into the roots and certainly i think on uh, in riparian locations i mean the rivers and streams are a major way of this pest uh propagating yeah in, in new locations yep exactly uh lori had a question in the chat about minimum acreage no lori uh there's no minimum acreage um we do small projects, big projects. It really, though, I guess the only thing is back to that buffer width, right? So it could be a half an acre as long as there's enough buffer width, right? We wouldn't want to just come in and plant one row of trees. Um, you know, the, the idea is to get more diversity and, and more uh, roots into that stream side so as long as there's enough width it, it could be a small stretch of the you know, of the river it could be a hundred feet um it doesn't have to be a big hay field or cornfield uh sand and paint yeah so that's for the beavers um so i've seen it in a couple of places if if folks didn't want it don't want to use the uh, chicken wire I think, and I haven't done this myself, but I think from what I've read and heard is that, you know, they literally take a bucket, a gallon of paint and they add sand. And I don't remember what the ratio is. I know there's some, I've read some stuff on it. So there's something out there on, on Google um, about it and maybe a two to one ratio, um, but it's got to be enough sand in the paint, you know, to make it uh, apparently uncomfortable for the beavers when they start chewing. Um, so I don't know, generally, maybe we can find more information on that and share it out to folks. If, if you've got a sign up sheet or a way to contact people after this. Yeah, sure. You can okay. send out info if it's requested. So Lori, I can, I can try to find, um, that info and then we'll send it to you. This is Janet again. Um, I've got another question. So one of the things that I've done on, on the more steeply forested portions of my land leading down to the creek is to create little check dams just with debris. And um, and when it comes to the creek, I've thought about doing, because the creek, I mean, it's like maybe a foot to two feet deep, depending, you know, sort of three to four feet wide. Um, and, and I've thought about, well, gee, what, maybe I should create some little check dams in the creek itself, like, you know, where you put a log in it or something to kind of help hold the, um, you know, hold the the, the soil and the, the whatever's washing down. But I don't even know if that's, it is, it is a classified wetland. So I don't know if like that would be legal, not that anybody would check, 
but you know, I, I feel sort of like a little knowledge is, is could be dangerous here, right. you know, or if I, you know, cut a tree and if, if it falls into the Creek or into the wetland, like, is that a, you know, I, I haven't done that, but it, I've thought about it. And it's like, well, like, should I even be doing that? And so, um, and I've reached out to the state, you know, it's just, it's just hard to, I think there's so many bigger fish to fry that, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to get answers. So um, yeah, do you have any feedback for that? Yeah, and it's hard to read. I mean, you can go online to the state uh, agency of natural resources and read the wetlands rules, but that's a slog too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so two things, Janet. Yeah, you know, anytime you're doing something in the river or in the wetland, you you need to check with the state because most times we are required to get permits not to plant trees on the on the banks, but anytime you're in the water. Okay almost always you need a permit from the state okay. um there's there are some cases where you don't um but your your thought is good right because one of the projects we do and we work with red start out of corinth um they used to call it chop and drop the u.s forest service would do it mm -hmm. in the green mountains but now mm -hmm. it's called strategic wood edition and it's something that the federal government actually helps fund where we're going into small streams we're cutting trees out of the forest, dragging them into the brook, and we're creating little log jams and little steps, you know, little pools that are going to okay. be developed. So that the concept you have is is the right one. The question becomes, yeah, do you need a permit from the state to be able to do it? And I, I don't work for the state, so I can't answer that. My guess is maybe. Um, and if you want, okay. I, I can help. Uh, connect you rebecca chalmers is our wetland specialist here in the area so okay, okay rebecca great. would be the one we could reach out to okay awesome yeah i'll send you some pictures and before before we go um i don't know if most of you are in the onaquichi black um area but uh, other important folks to know, Marie Gaduto works for Vermont DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation. Marie is the basin planner for the Black and the Ottaquichi, also for Southern Vermont. Um, Marie is a valuable resource. If, if any of you ever have questions, um, state questions state funding questions regulation questions marie is awesome she works out of the springfield office um her husband michael gaduto runs sustainable woodstock um so michael is a uh, is um got a lot of a lot of other things on his plate but they do do some of this work also you know they do tree plantings and um I think they have an erosion control project at the community garden actually underway, just just right across from the Billings Farm. One of those root wad projects, as I recall. So they're going to go back, you know, get an excavator on that bank. What's that, Barbara? Yes. Um, I live in a town where several of our contributing streams to the Connecticut have sewer lines a very short distance from the edge of these streams. And of course they erode. I was wondering what the alternative way to stabilize those stream banks that uh, is something other than riprap, which the town tends to, I won't name the town, but <laughs> the town tends to call a solution. Yeah. Um, and it does get difficult when you start talking about riprap because even the engineer, or sorry, when you start talking about sewer uh, lines, because even the engineers start to get nervous. Um, and uh, sometimes they will, you know, because they're stamping these plans that are getting a permit, right? So it's, it's um, their reputation on the line. And I know we have had some cases where um, rock was used because that was the only thing that the engineers were comfortable with. Um, a lot of those root rod projects that we're doing, those large wood installations, you know, those are designed to last, you know, 20 or 30 years. 
to give the buffer plantings a chance to grow up and help hold that bank in place. Whereas the riprap, you know, will be there potentially forever or until the next Irene type event. And some of it will get, you know, moved around then maybe. But um, so it's a tricky one with the sewage lines um, and towns are almost always going to take the rock. Um, first of all, they have it. Um, it's easy for the town to install uh, a root wad project. You know, you have to go find a logger and a forest and, you know, you got to harvest those trees. Uh, it's a much more, uh, I guess, sort of intensive process. Um, it's what we tend to do because it is a, a softer approach and a, and again, it's not designed to be permanent, um, permanent, maybe in my lifetime, but not, you know, permanent, permanent. So I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer for you there, Barbara. It is uh, a tough nut to crack, so to speak. Yep. I agree. <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had a better alternative. <laughs> I wish you did too. <laughs> All right. Well, we hit our one o'clock. Any uh, last minute questions or Jillian, anything you need to tell folks? Um, no, I'm good. Other than come to more workshops. We have a <laughs> phonology one and a vernal pool one next month, if you're interested. And we'll get the follow-up materials. I'll look for the uh, info on the paint in the sand in the paint and um, any, oh, I can send some, We've got some information about the live stakes because that really is something that's easy. Folks can do that, you know, yourselves. You don't need to hire a crew or anything like that. And if you have willows or dogwoods nearby, you can cut them and do them yourself. So I'll send out some guidance on that also, or I'll send it to Jillian. She'll send it out. Okay. Sounds good. If you want to receive that information, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. I'm gonna Thank you. Stop recording.